Thanks for tuning in to our message at Coastal Christian Ocean City. For more information on anything going on here, you can visit our website at ccoceancity.com or check out our app in the App Store or Google Play. Today, Pastor Matthew will be bringing the message. So without further ado, here's Pastor Matthew. In the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he delivered a teaching widely known as the Beatitudes. In the teaching, he presented eight declarations of blessedness. The Beatitudes describe the ideal disciple and his rewards, both present and future. Conversely, at the end of Jesus' ministry, he gives his final public sermon where he presents eight denunciations, or woes. These final woes, which are in stark contrast with the beginning blessings, are directed at the religionist, the one who makes a claim on God, but whose life completely defames God. What does this have to do with Palm Sunday? You see, it was only a few days after Jesus arrived in Jerusalem on a donkey, where he returns to the temple to deliver his final public words before he would die for the sins of the world. And to that end, let's consider some of what he said and how these indictments, or woes, on religion can help us better understand the blessing of being in right relation with God the Father through Jesus Christ the Son. This is the sermon nobody's preaching on Palm Sunday. Well, if the title of the message doesn't explain or give an indication of where we're going this morning, I guess the message will follow up with that. This is truly the sermon that nobody's preaching on Palm Sunday. So I've been reading, obviously, this account for the past several months. New into my assignment was Palm Sunday. And of course, last year I stuck to the Sunday and the arrival of Jesus Christ. Of course, this is prophetic. This is predicted. This is Zechariah 9.9, where the, Jude- the Jewish nation were instructed how their Messiah would arrive. He'd be, he would come on a donkey, and he did. And the people gave fanfare and they celebrated and they laid palm branches down in his path. Symbolic, of course, of victory that came. They chanted a psalm, Hosanna, which means save us now. The people's expectations was for a king like David to come and overthrow the Roman oppression. And of course, they put that on Jesus as a physical king. However, they missed the point of his first coming, which is to be a spiritual deliverer from sin. And then they quoted Psalm 118, 26. It says, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Jesus. Now, interestingly, Jesus gets through the city and Luke tells us he draws near, sees the city and weeps over it. Tears came out of our Savior's eyes because the city who he came to save completely missed him. The only other time that we see him weeping is at a tomb because of what sin and death had done to his creation. Now notice that they missed their hour of visitation. That's what Luke says. They missed their hour of visitation. This should take the Bible scholar back into the Old Testament, Daniel chapter nine to be exact, where an angel named Gabriel said to Daniel, here, write this down, and gave him a prophetic timeline. Listen, church, to the day, which is what we celebrate, Palm Sunday. To the day, they were to expect their Messiah. That was the hour of visitation that they missed. Now, what happens? Night falls, he goes out into Bethany. Monday morning dawns. He comes back to the temple, and he overthrows the money changers. It's where he says, you've turned my father's house into a den of thieves. It's supposed to be a house of prayer, a house of praise, a house of purpose. This house was supposed to bring people to my father. Of course, Tuesday dawns. He comes back to the temple. In scripture, an unleashing of teaching from Jesus, which we often don't cover. Why? unless we're in that particular book, covering that particular chapter, coming across that particular verse, you often don't hear these passages of scripture because traditionally we stay to Palm Sunday, we jump over to Good Friday, and then we hoot and holler about Resurrection Sunday. But what about what Jesus said on Tuesday and the parabolic teachings about end times, about judgment, and then his final public Sermon. I think we should 
listen carefully to what Jesus' final public sermon said, because he did not present to them an invitation to salvation. What do you think, right before the cross, that one last plea to the religious elite, one last plea to the Pharisee, the Sadducee, the scribe, one last, an invitation to salvation. No, Jesus gives a denunciation of condemnation. Oh, this is truly the sermon that nobody's preaching on Palm Sunday. But they should have been clued in even deeper than that. The exact day of that Sunday was 10 Nisan. That was how Jews calculated their calendar. Similar to what we say today is the 14th of April. Well, what was significant about 10 Nisan? Exodus chapter 12 says that on this day, the 10th of Nisan, the Israelites were supposed to choose their Passover lamb. And that lamb was to be sacrificed symbolically of the angel of death that passed over their households. It was pointing to Jesus. Symbolically, Jesus was the lamb. Well, on that day, God chose that lamb. And then Monday and Tuesday, just like the Israelites were supposed to vet that lamb, it's supposed to be without spot, without blemish. What do you think all the questions that came at Jesus were about? They were vetting him. The questions about taxes, who do you pay taxes to, Jesus? The questions about resurrection from the Sadducees, the question about marriage, the question about what's the greatest commandment? That all took place on Tuesday. He would turn out to be the lamb, spotless, without blemish. They should have known the scriptures. Jesus gives this final sermon. I wanna read how he ends it. Matthew 23, verse 37. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is what they chanted on Sunday. This is what Jesus alludes to on Tuesday. He says, you missed who I was on that day and you're missing who I am on this day. But the woes, that he lays out before them, we need to consider. Wanna know why? Because Jesus wept over Jerusalem because they missed him. And Jesus says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets, again, with the heart of grief. Let me say this, church, look at me carefully. God's heart does not grieve over disease, over war, over politics as much as his heart grieves over the religion or the person that keeps people from him. That's what makes God's heart grieve. Any person that makes a claim on God, yet their life defames God, that's what makes God's heart grieve. Anyone who calls out to God as Jehovah, as Allah, or as Father, yet their life does not reflect him, woe to them, woe to you to make a claim on God, yet leave church on a Sunday and our lives completely defame God. These eight denunciations are completely in contrast with Jesus' eight blessings. You see, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' first public sermon, he lays out what we call the Beatitudes. And there are eight blessed statements which are perfectly in comparison with these eight denunciations. Now you might say, I've never heard that. Wow, he's really insightful. And I go, no, I just know how to read. And when we put them together, I'm not squeezing scriptures together to try to make it fit. We're gonna go back and forth the rest of this morning and look at the woe and compare it to the blessing. Matthew 23, verse 13. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, and hypocrites. Scribes, they were the writers of the law. The Pharisees were the stricklers of the law. And the hypocrites, that meant they were two-faced. Listen to the indictment. For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. It's bad enough that they're not going in, though they have access to it. How much worse is it that they're keeping others from going in? So the entire establishment of Judaism 
God laid it out perfectly. The Old Testament points to the way that the people of God were supposed to be a beacon of hope to a dark world. The Gentiles were supposed to see how blessed and favored they were and crave and want that. The Christian is supposed to be blessed and favored so that the world around us sees it and wants it. But here they are, the ones who held the keys of knowledge, the scriptures say. Yet instead of introducing people to the God they say they served, they shut people away. See, they were the doorkeepers, yet they kept people from the door. Jesus in John chapter 10 said, I am the door of the sheep. He was saying, you can't actually find the pasture. You can't enter into my kingdom. You can't get to my father unless you come through me. I'm the door. Yet anybody that makes a claim on God, whether in religion, denomination, or a ministry, yet completely keeps people away. You know how they do that? They put burdens on the people, heavy burdens. And they made a name for themselves and it was about pride, complete pride, which is the opposite of the blessing. The blessing comes to those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Are you seeing the difference here? Those who are humble have access to the door. Those who are dependent upon God comparatively to those who are rich in their own spirit. That's what religion makes you do. Makes you feel like you're rich in your own spirit and your accomplishments. And Jesus says, no, blessed are those who are spiritually bankrupt, those who recognize they got nothing apart from me. That's where we begin. It's called humility, dependence upon God. I got nothing to give you, God. Oh, he goes, oh, yours is the kingdom of heaven. You see what's being propagated by religion is faith that says, do. And faith that says do keeps you from confession of faith that says done. See, when Jesus went to the cross, he didn't say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. The work that the Father has assigned me to do, it is finished. Can't be added to, can't be taken from. Your good cannot get you to God and with Jesus Christ, you're bad. Can't even keep you from God. The cross says done. We as believers, we don't work for salvation. We work from salvation, which is a discipline of working out your salvation. Paul to the Philippians, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. This is serious thought. Consider one foot in the world and one foot in the word. That's a divided neutral stance. That's the complacent Christian. The Bible says, no, put one foot, put them both in the word of God or put them both in the world. Make a decision. Religion says do, faith in Christ says done. Woe to you, verse 14, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, mask wearers, for you devour widows' houses and for a pretense, make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. This is radical language. This is offensive. Safe people say, that was very offensive. Jesus said, no, no, you, you see what you're doing? You have created a spiritual Ponzi scheme. You know how they would do that? When a wife would lose her husband and she became a widow, the religious leader claiming the knowledge of the law would come alongside of her and explain to her how he knows the law and he can help her. And if you make me the executor of your estate, I can help you with your property. It was manipulation, it was conniving. And at the end of that, the church wound up owning the property. Does it sound familiar? It's a TV evangelist who looks out through the camera and says, hey, if you, Donate money to my ministry. Blessings upon blessings will come upon your house. Calling out to the weak, calling out to the confused, calling out to the widow, the one that's not covered, the one that doesn't have spiritual protection and manipulating. And story after story can be read about people that were taken advantage of by a ministry that said, if you give me all your money, healing will come to your home. Oh, and the healing never comes. 
And the person is left disoriented, completely taken advantage of. That's why false religion exploits the exposed. True religion ministers to those who mourn. True religion covers those who are afflicted. James would write it like this, chapter one, verse 27. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, the distressed, the afflicted, the hurting, the broken, and to keep one self unspotted from the world. You see, it's not just about charity, it's also about integrity. Amen. True religion is ministering and covering the afflicted. It's reaching out to those who are hurt. It is the blessing. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, not taken advantage of. See, I can only comfort you because at one point in my life, I found myself in an uncomfortable situation. And instead of reaching out for the comforts that the world gives, I reached out to God's comfort. And like a blanket, it comforted me. And God says, now that I've given you my comfort, son, you go become a capable comforter because there are people that will go through distress and trial and tribulation, and they're gonna need to know that my comfort is sufficient. And you then give them what I've given you. Thanks, mom. <laughs> Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted, which is completely the opposite of manipulating those who need comfort. Here's the woe, verse 15. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. You travel land and sea to win one proselyte. And when he is one converted, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Wow. This is the Lord of love. This is the God of grace speaking such harsh terms. What grieved his heart? What made him unleash a sermon? Oh, religion did. The religionists did. They were zealous to make conversions. They would travel land and sea to convert people over to, guess what? Their group, not God. They were so passionate. It is our present day door knocker, Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses. Bobby, I can't believe you're mentioning names. Oh, you need to know the truth. Amen. They're passionate about converting people over to their false religion. Well, they go from the Bible too, Pastor. Oh, they do, but they diminish Jesus' divinity and they say he was nothing but a created being. In fact, they even say that he was the archangel Michael. It's called heresy, church. It needs to be called out needs to be taught properly. Jesus says, I'm not against ze zeal. I love passion, but zeal without the harness of heaven produces anything from legalism to religious terrorism. See, the harness of heaven is the Holy Spirit. He says, I'm gonna take that zeal, but I wanna harness it and I wanna use you. Oh, under control. See, legalism presents a checklist. A legalist divorces the law from the God of the law. And if you don't dress a certain way in church, you know, wear a tie and a suit. Oh, you guys have a drum kit on your stage? The legalist can be seen correcting a child running in the sanctuary as opposed to getting down and talking to the young man, the young boy. You wanna identify a legalistic church? It looks like their greeters were baptized in lemon juice. Religious terrorism can be seen in Saul of Tarsus. Saul who became Paul before the harness of heaven got a hold of his life. Saul was persecuting with such zeal. He thought he was right. In the name of his God, he was persecuting the way, the truth, the Christians. And he was zealous for that cause. And God said, well, once I get hold of your life, I'm gonna rewire you, reconstruct you. You know the law so well, Paul. You are a strickler, you're a Pharisee. However, when I get a hold of you, it's all gonna make perfect sense. It will go from religion to relationship. And when the apostle Paul was unleashed on the world, man, half the New Testament is evidence of what God wants to do with a life who has zeal harnessed by heaven. That's why the blessing falls upon, guess who? The meek. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. 
Woe to the person who's converting people and they're inheriting hell. Blessed upon the meek. When they're converting people, they inherit earth. This is a saying as if the, the Israelites were promised what was known as Canaan, the promised land, to inherit the promises of God. That's what inheriting earth means. It's not inheriting actual earth. It's saying the meek, you inherit heaven. You inherit the kingdom. You inherit the promises of God. Who are the meek? Well, meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength under control. Amen. The imagery, the word is praus in Greek. It is a wild stallion, out of control, bucking, horsepower, that needs to be broken in order to be ridden, in order to be saddled. That wild stallion needs to be broke. And that's the word meek. I know what that feels like, being a wild, out of control, passionate young man in the world. And then when the Lord got a hold of my life, it was brokenness so he could be harnessing me for his use. That's it. Hallelujah. We convert people over to not a religion, not a ritual, not a tradition. Their conversion points people to Jesus Christ. Matthew 23, 16. Woe to you, blind guides who say, whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Jesus continues. He actually says to them, you guys are making promises which are of no effect based on how you're swearing it or how you're vowing it. They would actually say, well, if we vow to do this or that on the gold of the temple, then it's, it's substantiated. But like a little kid who holds his hand behind his back with crossed fingers, doesn't have to keep his promise. It's exactly what they were doing. They made, they made the things of God about semantics. And that's what false religion does. It's full of lies. It's full of semantics. They tell you to pray to a saint and this will come upon your life. That's semantics. The Bible I read and study, I know nothing of that. The scriptures know nothing of praying to saints, praying to a virgin. This is the sermon nobody's preaching on Palm Sunday. Amen. Oh, you didn't get the healing that you prayed for? The problem's you. You don't have enough faith. Semantics. True religion is about hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Right standing. No games. What you see is what you get internally and externally. Would to God that we would hunger and thirst and crave his righteousness, his presence. What would a church look like when we came together? It wasn't about the song. It was about the one we were singing to. It wasn't about the message. It was about the one who gives the message through. Would to God that we would be filled by his presence, that our appetite would be filled by him. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, for they shall be filled. See what we're filled with? Truth, which is in contrast to them making vows of no effect. Their yes was not yes, and their no was not no. They were filled with lies. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Jesus ends with humorous hyperbole. The smallest creature unclean in Judaism was a gnat. The largest unclean creature was a camel. Jesus saying it's ridiculous that you're straining out a little gnat from your drinks yet you're swallowing a camel. He says, it's actually honorable how tedious you are in your tithing. Those mentioned, mint, anise, and cumin are spices and herbs. Picture a plate full of seeds, thousands of them. They would actually count them, and one out of every 10 would be tithed to the church. I don't know how they did that but they were very meticulous. And notice Jesus is not condemning them for majoring on the minor. Oh, the indictment comes for them completely missing the matters that were major. Justice, mercy, faith. 
Jesus said this earlier on in his ministry. Of course, they were mad that he was mingling and ministering to the least of these, the last, the sinners. Jesus says, hey, Matthew chapter 9, verse 13, go and learn what this means. Anytime Jesus says, go and learn what this means, as a Bible student, you need to get into the scriptures and say, what does that mean? You see, when he said it, he's speaking as God. He's saying, this is what I desire, mercy, not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I cannot call those who have it all together because they do not need a savior. I'm calling those who are honest in their sin, who are open to be ministered to, to those who say, I have nothing without God. I am poor in spirit, spiritually bankrupt. I need your Holy Spirit comfort, and he gives it. And then I become meek, and then I pursue righteousness. And here, Jesus says, quoting Hosea 6.6, 6, which is God himself through the prophet, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I desire the knowledge of who I am more than burnt offerings. I desire relationship, not religion. I want you to know me, God says. My heart bleeds mercy. That's why the blessing comes upon, blessed are those who are merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Are you seeing the connection here? They lacked mercy. They are put a woe upon. Jesus says, bless are those who are merciful. This simply means, church, your life gives out mercy. Your life gives out forgiveness, willingly, not begrudgingly. Your life gives out compassion. You're known for your compassion, not your judgment. See, too many Christians look down their noses at things they don't understand. How could they do that? And just because you would not do that doesn't mean you have the authority to judge that. Gossip, judging other people, slandering. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are those who give out grace. People of compassion. Conversely, and of course, unlike little Nancy, who was in her garden, filling a hole, the neighbor peering over the fence, curious, of course, he says, hey, Nancy, what are you doing? Nancy said, my goldfish died and I'm burying him. The neighbor then asked another question. Nancy, why are you digging such a big hole for such a small goldfish? She patted down the final heap of dirt upon the hole and said, because it's inside your stupid cat. I don't know how that got there. I think Matt Stokes hijacked my notes and added that illustration. <laughs> and some of you know I would love to make a case for Nancy's mercy in that situation, but I do not want to receive any emails from the weird cat enthusiasts amongst us, <laughs> like our worship director, Pete Magazoo, in case you didn't know. But here's what we do. Oh, we won't kill a cat, but we'll kill character. We won't put dirt on that, but we put dirt on people's reputation. It's when we bury somebody under our judgment. So we look at them and no mercy. Hey, Christian, the person that says, I can't forgive will not be forgiven. I didn't say that. Jesus did. Jesus said that. Our forgiveness comes out of recognizing that we've been forgiven. And that's why the mercy we show is in direct proportion to the mercy we know. If you know mercy, if you've been given mercy, you will show mercy. I'm not saying it's not gonna be hard. I know some of you have been through some stuff. There's been abuse in every type of way and it's hard to get over that. But what I'm saying is get your eyes off the circumstance and put it onto Christ. And Christ, based on your volition, not your emotion, will help you forgive. Because if you're waiting for the emotion to forgive, look at me. You'll be waiting for all eternity. You'll never do it. You'll never get around to it because emotion won't do it because I don't feel like forgiven. And Jesus says, well, I will forgive through you. 
I'm in circles of ministry. I am a minister. I travel and I speak in all types of ministry events. And I meet all types of people with different backgrounds and different denominations. And I'm not stereotyping when I say I meet people who have such a deep pursuit of being a theologian, yet they completely miss the simplicity of just being a Christian. Oh, they can quote the Bible. They know it all. When I tell them what I did, oh, they are so quick to look right down their nose and judge. God forbid. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. Remember, Jesus is with his boys, and of course, the Pharisees come over and say, Jesus, your boys just ate bread, and they did not clean their hands. And then Jesus tells them, I get what you're saying. Yes, ritual purification and cleansing, wash your hands. We need to have proper hygiene, correct. However, what defiles a man isn't what goes in his mouth, it's what comes out of his mouth because what comes out of his mouth comes from the heart. Jesus is quick to go back to the heart. So while the religionist puts such a heavy emphasis on external presentation, Jesus is solely focused on the heart's condition. Oh, in case you're not understanding what I'm saying, I'm talking about from Roman Catholicism to the Muslim and to the Christless Christian who makes a presentation out of external rituals. Oh, the robes that we wear, the platform that we are on. I was in prison with Muslim men who would spend so much time during a day, X amount of times a day in the bathroom, at the wash sink, literally washing their ears, washing their hands, washing their feet, washing every part of their body. And that was all great and good. It looked all holy and all until they walked down the housing unit, running amok, cursing, profaning, and literally going into the bathroom with what is called a flick book, an inappropriate book. Yeah, but they got their little ritual in. So it is to the religionist who puts out the finest. The outside of the cup looks great. It looks good. It's clean. But the inside, the inside is filthy. That's why blessed is the pure in heart. For they're the ones that see God. They're the ones that see God in their circumstances. The one that has a pure heart. How do you get a pure heart? Chris spoke about it a couple weeks ago. The pure heart is a clean heart. It's the word unmixed. It actually is related to the word refinement when you purify metal. And there's only one way to have a pure heart. It comes by refinement from the testings of the world, which God allows, and it comes from the teaching of the word. Those are separate but inseparable. You see, what God allows to touch my life is refining fire, trials, because he's burning off the dross and the impurities that the world naturally has clinging to me. And the fire burns it away. So instead of turning to God and getting mad at him for allowing a trial, I'm simply to say, God, thank you for allowing this trial and this fire because without it, I would not look more like Jesus. And then he says, get in my word because the teaching of the word brings a refining fire as well. And the heart becomes pure. And a heart that's pure sees God. A pure heart sees God. In comparison, of course, to the blind Pharisee who only had focus on the exterior. Now, this next woe is going to sound very familiar and similar to what we just covered. But there's a couple words that need to be considered. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Ready? For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, like the cup, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. For even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside full of hypocrisy and iniquity, lawlessness. Similar, right? So we're dealing with the exterior versus the interior. What is the difference between what Jesus just said about the outside of the cup and the inside and what he's saying about a whitewashed tomb and dead bones? Well, the first woe dealt with being a spiritual counterfeit. Look at me. This woe deals with being a spiritual contaminant. 
So one thing to be by yourself, acting like you got it all together, an entirely different thing to bring people in to that false religion, to tell them it's a good work, just do this and you'll be good with God. He calls them whitewashed tombs. You know what a whitewashed tomb was? Of course, it was like putting makeup on the place of the dead. But at this time, with over millions of people in that city for Passover, they would whitewash the tombs so that when you came through, you could recognize unclean. Jesus is saying, steer clear from that type of person, the religionist, because inside they're dead. Their spiritual influence pushes people away from Jesus. See, that's what whitewashed lives do, promoting religion, ritual as their salvation. But those who are washed white know that it's only the blood of Jesus that does our cleansing. Oh, it's not holy water. It's not holy classes. It is not a holy day. It is a holy God. He is the only one that can purify and cleanse our hearts. Whitewashed life may appear righteous. Influence pushes people away from Jesus. It's what the prosperity gospel does. It's what Pete was talking about a couple weeks ago. Pete simply presented out of the scriptures how a promise from religion, which is disguised by the gospel. You should be happy, healthy, and wealthy. There it is. There's the influence, Jesus. But then when you don't get healthy and you don't get wealthy, and obviously life takes away the fact that you're happy, you then turn to God and you question him. And you go, this promise failed me. And God has enough. God had enough of that. He sends the gospel so that people claim Jesus Christ. Here's the opposite. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who introduce people to the Prince of Peace. That's it. Blessed is the individual that says, I can't help you get good with God, but I'll introduce you to the one who reconciled the word exchanged relations, one at war to one at peace. I'm not introducing you to anything except for Jesus. That's all I got. Jesus, period. Not Jesus and good works. Not Jesus and this prayer. Not Jesus and this denomination covering. Jesus, period. Jesus is the only one. He is the peacemaker. And if we are children of God, we point people to him. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Because you build the tombs of the prophets, you adorn them as monuments of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have partaken in the blood of the prophets. Listen, Jesus like, I know you're saying that if you were alive when they were alive, that you would not have killed the prophets. Here was the irony. As he's taking the thought out of their mind, they are currently plotting to kill him. They are currently plotting not to kill a prophet. They are going to kill the prophet. They are going to kill the king. They are plotting to kill the son of God. He continues and says, you've not only partaken in that blood, that guilt is on your head. You've killed all the prophets from A to Z. He literally says that. From Abel all the way to Zechariah. He says, what could save them? What could save them from the condemnation of hell? This is where he ends. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, came to save you, came to have you come to me like a mother hen protecting her chicks. This grieved his heart. He says, woe to the persecutor. And the eighth blessing, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Ultimately, to be on the pathway of blessedness, we must come to a point where we are recognizing our brokenness. That's it. That's the first step. Recognizing you are broken. I got nothing to offer. I am poor in spirit, spiritually bankrupt. The Holy Spirit comes in 
and he comforts you because you're mourning over your sin. And then he picks you up and says, here's my harness. Now go be meek. And oh yeah, by the way, when you get depleted, come back and hunger and thirst for me. And when you're hungering and thirsting for righteousness, oh, the very next thing is you point people to Jesus because you become a peacemaker. And by the way, if you live that way, you can expect to be persecuted. You can expect to be made fun of. But stay in brokenness because brokenness is a heart of repentance. And the only way to look like Jesus is to have that heart of repentance. Repentance means change your mind. About what? About religion and enter into relationship. Change your mind about what? Sin and put your eyes on the sun. Change your mind. See, if you desire to be more like Jesus, church, do not be surprised when you are questioned by Nicodemus, when you're persecuted by Caiaphas, when you're betrayed by Judas, when you're rejected for Barabbas, and you end up suffering next to Dismas. And in case you don't know who Dismas is, he was the one who was made right in God's sight. He was the one to whom Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. He was the thief who hung next to Jesus. He was the one that Jesus said, today you will be with me in my kingdom. Today. His prayer. Remember me. Dismiss didn't have time to get off the cross and enter a class. Dismiss didn't have time to get baptized. Dismiss had nails through his hands so he couldn't raise his hand at the end of a sermon saying, I believe, let me just say it like this, salvation doesn't end with a raised hand in church. Salvation begins with a surrendered heart to Christ. Oh, Dismas could not come down this aisle and step up onto this stage. There was no altar call for Dismas. Dismas did not say, dear Jesus, would you accept me? Dismas said, Jesus, thank you for accepting me. Huge difference. Dismas was not engaged in religion. Dismas had nothing to give his Savior except a heart of contrition, brokenness. It was in that moment that salvation entered his soul. Good could not get him to God. In fact, his bad is what brought him to God. This is the sermon that nobody's preaching on Palm Sunday. It is our responsibility as Christians to understand the blessing of being broken, understanding that the Beatitudes in the beginning of Jesus' ministry was the true call for the disciple to seek after him, and then the woes that fell upon the religious establishment that kept people away from God. I say this, God forbid that anybody would be kept away from God because of us. As Pastor Matt said in the beginning, that we would invite people that might be far from God, invite people that don't know the one true God, because the gospel will go out. I've set the scriptures before your ears. My prayer as a minister is that the Holy Spirit would seal those scriptures upon your heart. And since we're not dead, we're not done. We've heard it. Let's do it. God bless.
As a church, we believe it's our responsibility to connect our community to Christ. So if you've enjoyed the message today, and we'd like to invite you to share it with your family and friends. We'll see you next week.